Hello again, everybody. It's Lori White from the Great Providence Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to episode number 102 of Chamber TV. And today we are absolutely thrilled to have with us one of my favorite people in Rhode Island, Michael Sabatoni. And Michael is the president of the Rhode Island Building Trades, very important organization here in Rhode Island, a coalition of very important men and women in the construction industry. So good morning, Michael. How are you today? I'm doing well, Lori. Thank you for having me uh, this morning. Um, and I wish you a happy new year. And to you as well. And um, we are, we've worked together um, for the past, oh, I don't know, Michael, what would you say, 10 or 15 years on so many issues in Rhode Island uh, that impact economic development. We've worked on issues around building projects. We've worked on issues around the uh, the expansion and modernization of TF Green Airport. We've uh, had so much in common because uh, if it's good for building and construction, it's good for the economy and it's good for business. So it's great that uh, we have so much commonality uh, on the issues. It's been a wonderful partnership and uh, coming together on issues that affect, affect uh, both your members and the men and women that I represent in the building trades uh, has been uh, one of the most uh, uh, things that I'm most proud of in my uh, capacity as president of the building trades. I was on a national podcast last week uh, on the radio, and uh, I was really focusing and talking about and was proud of the collaboration with the business community, uh, with, the, with the, the organized labor coming together. And usually when that happens, just uh, the three or four uh, endeavors that you just mentioned, uh, we're, I think we're batting a thousand percent, so we're pretty good at it. <laughs> well, we have uh, a new day ahead of us with some new uh, individuals taking the reins of our state. So let's start talking about that right mm -hmm. right off the bat. We uh, we have uh, now um, been confronted with a situation where our governor Gina Raimondo is headed to D.C. to take over. Uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce. So let me ask you, uh, Secretary Raimondo in D.C., what, uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, it's bittersweet for, for me uh, as, uh, as a big supporter of Governor Raimondo and as well as uh, all of the building trades. She's been uh, commonly referred to uh, as the building trades governor, uh, one of the first uh, um, groups that she reached out to and, and, and promised to get our men and women back to work and make making uh, sound uh, and big investments in infrastructure, as you can see, driving around the state of Rhode Island, uh, as well as fixing our schools and modernizing our commerce corporation and you know pretty much everything that she said she was going to do uh, to bring down the unemployment in Rhode Island, and more specifically in the construction industry, which was extremely high, uh, somewhere near 40 percent in some instances when she uh, when she took office. Um, it's, we're, we're sad to see her go, but I'm extremely proud of her and happy for her. Uh, you know, the, uh, this is an opportunity of a lifetime, obviously, when the uh, president-elect uh, calls on you to serve your country in a capacity like that. Uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to say no. So, um, yeah, it is, it's, it's bittersweet for us here in the building trades and in the labor union. You know, you the way you sum that up is exactly what we would say at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are really proud of her as well. And we've had a very strong working relationship with her and her team over mm -hmm. the last oh, six, six and a half years, I guess. Uh, and also before that, when she was general treasurer, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, her performance uh, with modernizing and professionalizing Commerce RI. Certainly uh, that was a huge step forward and um, her work with uh, Department of Labor and Training on workforce issues and higher ed issues just all across the board, you name it, um, from a business competitiveness point of view, uh, we've had such a marvelous working relationship with Governor Raimondo and look forward to um, seeing what happens next with her as she begins to address these really thorny problems on the national level. So yeah, sad to see her go, um, but you know, change is inevitable and um, we will heartily welcome uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee. So let's uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, the Lieutenant Governor potential. Where where does that stand? What kind of uh, working relationship have 
the lieutenant governor and have you spoken to him uh, in the last couple of days since this news has broken? I have not spoken to uh, to lieutenant governor, but uh, I've had the opportunity to to get to know Dan uh, when it, during, more specifically and when he was running again for lieutenant governor and um, you know, the building trades uh, and the laborers union uh, supported his candidacy. And um, I'm hopeful that uh, we will have the same relationship with Dan and keep the momentum that we've got going here in Rhode Island uh, that we have had with Governor Raimondo. And I think we will. I think when you look at uh, even the, the things that we're mentioning this morning, on uh, how important it is that labor has a seat at the table, especially uh, labor that, uh, you know, builds the infrastructure that keeps the, you know, the trains moving on time, the water, the sewer, the investments in, in renewable energy and clean energy as we're shifting toward, um, uh, you know, uh, to reduce our carbon footprints, et cetera. It's, it's really a no brainer that you have to have, uh, especially the building trade unions, not, as well as other unions as well. But um, we have such a big impact on, on commerce uh, just because of the nature of what we do. So I'm hopeful that we're going to have, and I think we will, uh, you know, the same relationship, obviously it'll be a little bit different, but uh, hopefully with the same outcomes that we've enjoyed under Governor Raimondo. And I'm, uh, I'm actually excited to roll up my sleeves and do whatever I can to make sure that uh, Governor McKee is, uh, is successful. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's uh, what we're all thinking at this point. Have, uh, have you talked to Governor Raimondo, by the way, on, uh, uh, on any I, of these matters? It was a pretty busy week last week. So uh, no, I have not, but uh, um, we're prepared obviously to send out, and I've been seeing the different messages come out from different people, politicians, business owners, laborers, uh, uh, labor groups, but uh, we'll be sending a statement out this, mo this morning about uh, her appointment, her appointment in the Biden administration. The other thing I'd like to give a shout out to is my good friend, Martin Walsh, uh, up in the city of Boston. Martin, uh, maybe some of the, your, your members don't know, was the past president of the Boston Building Trades and is a card carrying laborer uh, from Labor's local uh, 223 in South Boston. So. Uh, last week to see both Ma and, and the governor on that stage, me both professionally and personally, how proud I was uh, to be from this area of the country and obviously see two people I'm very fond of uh, get that type of recognition and, uh, and, and opportunity. So it was, uh, it was a pretty special uh, week last week. Mm. In light of all the other crap that we were watching on TV. So I was kind of saying when I had one of my, I had an executive board call on Friday morning with the building trades. And I said, you know, you're looking at what we saw the other day, I believe it was Wednesday with those riots and what have you, but still on Thursday, there was a sense of optimism, even, even looking at those ugly uh, videos of what was happening in DC. So, you know, like it's still kind of hard to believe that we're very optimistic. We just got to get through these next 12 days and hopefully uh, no other craziness happens and we can get back to mm -hmm. the work the American mm -hmm. people deserve and, uh, and start getting some grownups in the room. Well, you mentioned um, the the new preponderance of folks from New England playing a major role in the Biden administration, but we also need to point out um, the ascendancy of Senator Reid to the Armed Services yeah. Committee. So, you know, from a, a congressional leadership point of view, particularly with the defense sector being so vitally important in Rhode Island, we are very well positioned there. That is, you know, long time coming as well. Uh, we are so fortunate, and I, I have the opportunity to, to have gotten to know Senator Reid, Senator Whitehouse, Congressman Langevin, Congressman Cicilline. When I tell you we couldn't have a better delegation, I'm so fortunate to be able to work with them. And all Rhode Islanders should, be, uh, should know that as well on how hard they absolutely work uh, on behalf of all Rhode Islanders and how respected they are on Capitol Hill, uh, you know, evident of... Uh, of uh, Congressman Cicilline on the other side is, uh, you know, uh, one of the leaders and trying to hold this president accountable, uh, you know, Jim, uh, on his uh, expertise on cybersecurity and how people, he's probably the most uh, renowned in the in the House. Uh, and then uh, what, what Senator Whitehouse does for us on the renewables and on judiciary. And then absolutely uh, the ascension of, uh, of Senator Reid to uh, the chairmanship of uh, of armed services, you know, we're just we're just fortunate to have the team that we have uh, in our congressional delegation. And I, I'm actually 
uh, you know, happy and pretty damn proud of them as well. Uh, as uh, finally, or it's still a 50 50 split, but uh, finally being able to get some things done and don't watch uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, you know, what every effort that uh, uh, that our, our delegation does to try and make the lives of all Rhode Islanders and all, all of the American people better. Mm -hmm. So you've been a um, long time wise uh, prognosticator um, and observer of the Rhode Island political scene. So let me ask you, um, what do you think is going to happen with the um, the Lieutenant Governor's role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the appointment of, um, of a Lieutenant Governor or the legislature uh, particularly uh, passing legislation this year to make it an advice and consent um, activity. Now, the one the one downside with the pandemic, there was a lot of downsides with the pandemic, but one of the other downsides is, is that we used to pick up a lot of intel uh, when we would be, uh, you know, spending time, uh, sometimes a lot of time you know, in the hallways of, uh, of the state house and um, as well as you know, navigating the circuit out uh, on the uh, on the political scene with fundraisers, etc. So the intel isn't as um, uh, up to date as it would be if we had that human contact, which we'll all miss. But um, uh, I, if I was a betting man, I, I would be betting on that. I think the legislature is going to uh, take it up and 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 pick who the next lieutenant governor is. I don't know that to be fact, but that's just. Uh, that's just what my opinion is. I think they very well have to do that. So how, how would that work? And it's, it's, you know, at first blush, it seems like, well, you know, isn't that a constitutional question that the voters decide? Well, I haven't gotten it too far into the weeds on it, but I know there's been serious discussions on it. So it, it, I, I, can they take it up? Is it constitutionally viable? What would it look like? What would the percentage of the vote have to be? How many candidates, uh, you know, because it'd be great to say, okay, the General Assembly will pick. Well, then what if the General Assembly doesn't agree? And, uh, you know, that runoffs or, or what have you. So um, I, I'm sure all of those technicalities are being looked at. And if there is a way, I, I this might, again, just my personal opinion, if there is a way for the uh, General Assembly to do it, I, I very well think they might, you know. It might be too difficult or all the quick questions or, or I just raised might, uh, and they got a lot of other work that they need to do on their plate, maybe they won't. So I, mm -hmm. I, I know they are seriously looking at it, whether they actually do it might be another thing, but the fact that they're looking at it so seriously uh, is an indication that, um, again, they very well might. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that you are talking about it in um, such, with such specificity, I think should be a, a clue to everyone listening that this is an issue that um, we got to pay very close attention to in the in the coming days. Um, so and, I do think, and I do think that the lieutenant governor, whether he's uh, 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 being a, uh, whether he's chosen by Governor McKee or the General Assembly, I think is going to be uh, more important than ever, just due to the fact that um, I think the, the governor is going to actually need. You know, to to to, uh, to rely on people in walking into a pandemic. Uh, you know, I know he's a very smart man. He wouldn't be where he is if he wasn't. But you know, we all need help, and I think that having someone in that lieutenant governor position, especially in the circumstances we're in right now, can be a real asset to Governor McKay. Mm -hmm. What um, What do you think the the key issues that we all will be confronting in the 2021 session of the General Assembly? What a from your um, from your perspective, from your vantage point, representing the building trades, uh, what do you see on the horizon? Well, first and foremost, obviously, it's a, we always start with the budget. Uh, you know, and how we're going to deal with that. Uh, as you know, on March second, we've got uh, the bond questions uh, uh, that are going to go to every registered voter is going to get a mail ballot on March second, and the seven questions. And you know, we're putting a coalition together. Uh, that would be uh, seven questions, one answer, vote yes. You know, we've learned our lesson from uh, times in the past, trying to come out of difficult times. And this was this was an economic difficult time caused by the pandemic. And how we, how we come out of it is by stimulating the economy uh, so that we can get businesses back up and running as quickly as possible. And nobody can stimulate the economy quicker than government. Uh, and state government. So the fact that we're going to uh, 
uh, you know, invest in, keep the infrastructure programs going, invest in higher education, invest in housing, invest in uh, recreation, invest in, uh, you know, all the things that, that, you know, make the quality of life in Rhode Island better. Also creating jobs at the same time, a lot of which are construction jobs and the men and women I represent is going to be critical. I mean, I, I don't see any other way of us getting out of it uh, other than uh, that's why those bond questions are coming out on March 2nd, mm -hmm. so that we can prime this pump, get the motor going, and then, uh, you know, obviously the business kicks in along the way. And, you know, I bet I, on my office is downtown. Uh, you know, I can't wait to see activity on South Main Street and in the city of Providence and see these small businesses, because this is what's really impacted uh, when you do stimulus type um, um endeavors such as bond questions and spend money uh, to, to prime the pump and put, get the economy going. People get back to work and when they've got some expendable income in their pockets, they usually frequent a lot of small businesses. Uh, so that's the way that we've always known to get out of, you know, the circumstances we're in. And, uh, you know, when you add that with, uh, you know, the school construction things that are going to be happening, it's going to have to be the public sector. Um, investments that I think are then going to ignite the private sector businesses and large and small. So um, I'm optimistic. I really am about this, uh, you know, coming year. Obviously, we still got a couple of difficult months or maybe the first half of the year until we can get everyone vaccinated. But, um, you know, we're, 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 we're almost there. We just got to hunker down. And I do believe that better days are ahead. And it's, you know, there'll still be some difficulties, but we're going to work, roll up our sleeves and we're going to work our way out of it. Let me um, let me chat with you a little bit more about the bond issues. So um, as you well know, you and I and a bunch of your colleagues um, chatted on the phone last week as part of a larger coalition to raise awareness about the importance of mm -hmm. the bond issues in each of the sections, you know, seven questions, one answer, vote yes. Uh, so let's just, you know, just very you know, briefly take our listeners through um, what some of the key questions, bond issues are being, uh, voters are being asked to weigh in on and tell us about this special election. Yeah, so again, every every registered voter will get a mail ballot. No, you don't have to request it, it's coming automatically. And we're gonna obviously uh, ask that, uh, that the citizens of the state vote for Rhode Island's future and vote yes on these questions. And the questions are, again, for question one is uh, higher education investments in URI and RIC and Rhode Island College, uh, which uh, we, need, we need to continue to do. Uh, the question two is uh, infrastructure so that we can continue to uh, match and, 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 and get the, uh, the, you know, the allocations from, uh, from Washington. There's, a, you know, I think $70 million or so will leverage another 700 800 million from the federal government and uh, you know as you can see we're turning the corner and we we'll continue to make great progress on our infrastructure here in rhode island um you've got affordable housing you've got clean water you've got some recreational um you, you've got you've got a you've got a, a wide array of, of different areas where we need to uh continually make investments in this state and in our and in ourselves so the thing that's most important is the timing of these investments. Again, coming out of a pandemic, priming the pump, getting the economy back up and running and giving it a shot in the arm. And, and again, there's no one that can do that quicker and, and, and in the capacity that it needs to happen when you have events such as this that we're currently in to get out of them and get the economy going, then government spending money, smart money in areas that improve, uh, improve the quality of life for all Rhode Islanders and create jobs at the same time and stimulate the economy. So again, we've seen this work. We know how it works. We know we can do the work. We know we need to make the investments uh, anyway. Uh, so, you know, expediting that investment in ourselves for all the reasons I just mentioned, but the timing is of the essence so that we can get out of this and get going and get back to uh, uh, you know, normalcy or some sense of normalcy by get the economy going and then all of the support economies that'll come uh, from that spending and that stimulus. 
Yeah. So um, one of the things I'm worried about is voters ballot box fatigue, if you will. You right. know, it feels like we've been through so much um, and particularly watching what's been happening in other parts of the country with uh, various runoff elections. And it, it seems that it's been such a protracted season, very unusually. Um, we got to make sure that people turn out in March to actually, you know, vote on these issues. It's so important. We just can't leave it to chance. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about strategies to get people to say, yeah, you know, I got to come out one more time and do this. This is important. That's why, again, uh, you were on the call last week and you saw uh, the members that are, that are joining on to that coalition. And there are probably, <laughs> I don't even know how many more that are on individual questions. The building trades uh, have decided to take them on all as one question as to not say, okay, one, uh, by the way, we support them all anyway, but I know there are, uh, there are other coalitions out there right now that might be question two that would come from, uh, you know, the civil side and, uh, and the construction industries of Rhode Island, the, the big road builders, or the affordable housing advocates vote yes on question five uh, or whatever number question that is. I don't know, I don't know if it is indeed question five. But our approach is going to be to educate our members and then all the members in the AFL, which we have north of about 80,000 in the state. Uh, and then if you can educate them and their families on the impact this will have on police and fire, on teachers, on construction workers, on our public sector workers that keep local governments going. This is good for everyone to get the economy going. And, and we're not taking it for granted, which is why we're going to uh, you know, do a very sophisticated campaign, starting with our members and making sure at least our own membership in the AFL-CIO understand the importance of making sure that these questions absolutely do pass because, quite frankly, our future depends on it. Yeah, one of the other things, uh, Mike, that we were talking about is um, the necessity and the, you know, the the benefit of talking about General Treasurer Seth Magaziner, and he has done a lot of study on, on this issue and whether or not from a public financing point of view that we have the capacity to take on another um, round of debt. And the discussions that we've all had with him um, revolve around the fact that we do. So it's good news, isn't right. that correct? That is correct. And, uh, and the, with the help of uh, the General Treasurer of making sure that Rhode Islanders understand that Rhode Island is actually in a pretty good financial position right now. We are retiring debt pretty quickly uh, as we speak, and our capacity to you know continue to invest in ourselves via bonds has probably never been better. When you add that also to um, uh, the fact that money right now has never been cheaper to borrow, uh, you know it's it's a perfect time right now for, for us to make the investment again to try and come mm -hmm. out of this. Thing. We, yeah. and again, we'll, and then we'll still have the capacity and be in a good position a few years from now to then do our second wave of, mm -hmm. uh, of school bonding as well. So there, Rhode Island is in a good position right now and has, uh, and has the ability to do this, um, you know, which is why we're, we're going to get it done. But I think again, getting the message out to Rhode Islanders that the state can absolutely do this and is in a sound financial position to do so. And money is so damn cheap right now, it makes sense for us to do it in mm -hmm. addition to the things we just spoke about over the last uh, few minutes. Yeah. yeah, so interest rates are low. And as a result, a lot of bonded indebtedness is either being rolled over or right. it's being redeemed. So we are- right. you know, We're retired, so it's being retired. It's being uh, you know uh, redone and you know all the cities and towns have been doing that as well. So. Again, the time is really, but these are the opportunities that we see in front of us that are actually in our favor to do these type of things and pass these questions. You mentioned a, a very important um, other issue, which is the refurbishing of our public schools and mm -hmm. the bonds that were set aside for that at last election cycle, uh, the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce uh, and the building trades worked very closely to raise awareness about the benefits and the urgency and the necessity of that. So let's spend a minute or two talking about these schools and the, the condition of our schools and what's happened in the last couple of years from your perspective. Um, has, the, has the infrastructure um, caught up with current day realities in your opinion? 
Well, we are seeing uh, you know, um, progress in the communities like East Providence. If you get a chance to drive by and, and start to see that magnificent brand new school, um, you know, coming all coming together. Uh, uh, you see the investments that we've done in North Providence and the school system there, and and we're on the cusp now of Providence and Pawtucket uh, uh, and Cranston and Newport, where there'll be shovels in the ground this construction year. And we're very fortunate, uh, again, with the timing of these projects coming online. Why? Because the private sector investment in projects, uh, owners have pumped the brakes, obviously, to see what happens and how we come out of this pandemic. So uh, the fact that we've got these public works and public investments in these communities, more specifically in schools, like you have mentioned, is the timing is perfect. And the ability to get these schools up and operational uh, is, is paramount as well because the, the, the current schools that uh, that uh, we see in those communities aren't getting any better. They don't get better over time. And we don't wanna have to spend money on the older schools if we know we need a new one just to keep them operational, just to keep them safe and dry so that you know the occupants uh, can, uh, uh, can attend currently it's the old saying, you're spending good money, right? So the least amount of money we have to spend on a structure that we know we're going to replace, the quicker we can do it, 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 it all makes sense. So there's been a lot of learning. I've seen uh, in some areas our ability to, uh, you know, really do deep cleans in these schools and what have you. And uh, but, um, but again, these investments are necessary and then there'll be a second wave of them that'll come via the bond questions in, tw in 2022. And, you know, the, the taxpayers of Rhode Island know the conditions of what their buildings are. If you drive by a school that you went to, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 50 years ago and your kids are going to it now or, or what have you, or your grandkids, um, you, you know, it's time. We've got some old buildings in this state and, you know, we are making progress and, uh, and there are going to be some you know, dirt flying in the spring in those four communities. So you know, we're excited mm -hmm. about that. And it couldn't happen again at a better time where we need you know, be shot in the arm to get the economy going, uh, more specifically in the construction industry. I think it's um, safe to say that from a public taxpayer support point of view, the public has been very supportive of yes. furbishing the schools, run safe and dry. Uh, tremendous amount of outrage about the condition of the schools. And right. you, know, you say some of these buildings haven't been touched in years and years, and they might even look exactly the same. Right. <laughs> you know, such and such, you know, middle school, you know, 30, 40, 50 years right. ago when the conditions of the, the learning spaces and the, the facilities, the bathrooms, um, you know, kids can't learn in an atmosphere like that. So right. very especially, in the, especially in the inner cities where, it, where, where they need it, you know, even more so. And, and the other thing is most, or, or, I would say every community, Usually the school or, or, the, or the public buildings, most of which are schools, are the pillars of those communities. Those are where you have the events. Those are where, you know, in the auditoriums and on the grounds and the what have you. So making investments in those communities, I think, is why you've seen the success of people knowing we need to reinvest in ourselves, you know, because these buildings are a reflection of our community. And this is where we send our young people to spend a lot, most of their time uh, and in, in, in conditions, quite frankly, that they don't deserve to be sent into. So uh, all for all those reasons, uh, it, you know, it makes sense and long overdue. I know we had the opportunity together when we were um, uh, on that task force on the school bonding and, and doing the first wave that we just spoke about. And, and you and I had the opportunity to tour some of these facilities. And, you know, I, I've known and I know you know firsthand we've seen the condition <laughs> and why it's so imperative that we get these things done and get these new uh, buildings up and running. And, all, and ones that we can't save and salvage, we will. But in some instances, we waited so long, we, we have to build new ones. Yeah. Well, the reason I bring this up is, you know, just to talk about the notion of why bond issues are so very important and why people need to care about it. 
and how how it is that you know we go about financing these you know really big projects so whether it is the roads or whether it is the schools or clean water you know this whole voter approval process for bonds uh is is a way that we make some very serious inroads and a lot of progress but it, it takes voter participation too it does and again the learning environment you know, uh, uh, natural light, bringing into the classrooms, making the classrooms, uh, you know, uh, fiber optic ready in some of these buildings that don't have that that, that ability, making them, uh, you know, pretty much uh, green and self-sufficient to an extent where, you know, when, when you factor in all of these things where in some instances we're spending a lot of money on, on maintenance to keep them up and running every year, as well as the cost to operate such old buildings with old uh, you know, bones, I'll call them. And, 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 you know, we've seen in some instances, uh, when we take a tour and we go down, you know, some of the, some of the equipment in some of these buildings, the, the heating equipment, they don't even make anymore. And, 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 you know, the fantastic job and the difficult job that the, the men and women that we represent in most of those buildings to, 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 to keep them operational, how uh, resourceful they had to get to, to make their own pots or to do this or to do that. So for all those reasons, but then when you actually factor in the newer buildings, you know, their ability uh, to, to heat and cool in, in, in a, in a, in a, you know, new fashion actually saves money. And then again, all the money on some of the maintenance we have to do just to open up the schools every September, again, is spending good money after bad. So, um, you know, we're excited about that. And again, it's long overdue. So let's uh, segue to another topic um, that's very, very timely today. And and that is uh, the state of the construction workforce being on the job. And all along, um, construction in Rhode Island was considered an essential industry. And your member, uh, Michael, uh, continued to work throughout this pandemic right. because of the essential nature of the work that they do and and the projects that they're working on and you know the fact that they are you know considered um, you know any delays would have been really disruptive right. and costly. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you think that that's worked out compared to other states that weren't as lucky in terms of keeping the construction trades on the job. Well. The first thing that I'll say is I'm, I'm fortunate to have uh, the contractor associations that I have here in Rhode Island, you know, the coming together uh, together with our Build Rhode Island group that, that you're familiar with, um, the large construction associations in Rhode Island, and having the same relationship like we've spoken about at the beginning of, uh, of the segment here today, the labor management cooperation and trust we've been able to uh, to develop uh, allows us to sit down with instances such as what happened with this pandemic and come together as an industry and, and hit it as an industry uh, together. And so uh, I'm, I'm appreciative of that, as well as the men and women that we have that lace them up every day and go out there and keep the, you know, the water and the sewer projects going, that are keeping the, you know, the gas flowing, that are keeping the, the, the you know, the infrastructure projects moving. And um, it was very important as well to keep certain, certain segments of the economy going as well. Uh, you know, that is so important. And, you know, one of the things I think that we were able to do was really get buy-in from the membership, the, the, the contractors. We had some projects uh, where protocols might have been a little bit laxed and we had, you know, a, a immediate um, uh, impact on those projects. And, in some instances, even had some stand downs until they were corrected. We worked with the Department of Health. <coughs> we followed the CDC guidelines as well as our national building trades to implement all of the safety protocols as recommended with social distancing and staggered lunches and staggered start times and temperature taking and, and uh, proper sanitization stations and, uh, you know, no congregations, uh, you know, in, in big ways and, and all of those things. In some instances, it's difficult. Uh, because we have to be in close proximity on certain aspects of what we do. And we've tried to eliminate those to the best of our abilities as well and avoid those instances. But unfortunately, sometimes in a construction project, like we have a large concrete pour, it takes a lot of people uh, and they gotta, they're in close proximity to 
you know, pour a big deck or, or, or to place a lot of content. Mm -hmm. So we tried to schedule those as far off as we could and do it to the best of our ability. And I think we succeeded. The one thing that we didn't have to deal with, unfortunately for us, uh, that you saw in some of the other cities was we didn't really have any large vertical construction projects. Like, for instance, in the cities of Boston and New York, where they did have to shut down construction, men and material have to go up, you know, considerable stories, et cetera. And it was just, you know, almost humanly impossible to have. Uh, and the cost was actually more to try and even do those protocols uh, than it was to uh, pump the brakes and, and 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 shut them down for periods of time. But we we mm -hmm. up and running. We continue to be up and running, and I do think that's a buy-in from the building trade executive board as well as our employers, and uh, and I'm proud of that. So um, let's go back to that. That's kind of interesting. So that was that was the reason why construction was treated differently in other places. The the vertical. Yep. Need, yeah. Just essentially need more people, right? To right. And it would have made de -dent you couldn't de-densify when you're working in a high-rise structure. Is is that what you're saying? Yes, men, material, and stuff have to go up and down, and uh, you know, and and the, your time is money, and uh, you know, elevators and things of that nature, and you know, if you have to limit uh, people in close proximity as well as uh, the ability to get large people into a building and and then go up is a lot different when, than when construction is spread out more on a campus-wide or. Mm -hmm. or uh, or, or, or a building that doesn't have, you know, mm -hmm. some height and stories. So mm -hmm. I do think that was one of the major factors uh, on uh, in, in those two cities specifically that are in our region, New York and Boston, uh, for, for those reasons. And the amount of men that are on those projects, right? Some of those projects could have four or five, you know, 600 people on them at, one, at any given time. And, you know, that, that's a lot of people. We, we didn't have any projects that had numbers you know, that high on one specific project, which again, I found, mm -hmm. which I think led to the fact that we were able to keep going and we still had some issues, but we worked through them. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have a name for the projects that are, that are more typical in Rhode Island. What do you call them? Horizontal building? Yeah, they're like, well, they're more like campus settings, uh, you know, like, uh, like the stuff that we do at, uh, um, Amgen and, and URI and, um, you know, if you look around Citizens Bank, Fidelity, those type of projects that we've built in the past, they're more of campus settings where, you know, and even in downtown, you know, we're still trying to pursue, obviously, the, the, the Fane Tower project and hopefully that goes forward, but we really haven't had a, a, you know, a large vertical construction project here. I think probably the last one was the Citizens Bank building down in Water Place Park. Uh, uh, you know, something north of 15 stories. So, you know, I'm hoping we do. I'm hoping we fix the Superman building and, uh, you know, we've got some opportunities. I do really believe that once we come out of this pandemic and all, all the things happen uh, of what we mentioned with the, with, with the public investment, private investment is going to follow pretty damn fast. And I, and I hope we do get some, some mm -hmm. nice vertical, you know, significant vertical construction in the city of Providence. I think it's long overdue. Mm hmm so do you think Governor Raimondo turned Secretary Raimondo will be thinking about the Superman building when she's in DC? And it's, it, it's on my it's on my list when I send her you know her good luck card. So there'll be a little list wish list in there. Don't forget about these things. Yeah. You know, you have um, by the way, and I know and I know she won't anyway. She's been she's had her finger on the pulse on everything Rhode Island since the day she was elected. And like I said, I've had yeah. to to, to work with her and her administration, her whole team. So I'm hoping that I'm hoping some of the team stays in place as well. We haven't really mentioned that too, too much, but right. we need some people like Stefan and Peter in the department of transportation uh, and alike to, you know, to stay and, and, and continue the good work that they've, that, that, that they've been doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And these are very difficult assignments, very difficult departments and organizations right. to run and manage and to be proactive and, also to be in sync with with best practices across this country right. and to know you know exactly how you need to proceed in order to be competitive and what kinds of projects are being approached you know that might that might look different than perhaps it looked like in a in a different setting so um well, I you mentioned you mentioned at the at the beginning of the segment we were speaking about um and we both were talking about uh, modernizing our commerce corporation, you know, and, and 
now when the businesses come here, there's some predictability and there's uh, a, you know a, a real um, sophisticated approach on on how we speak with and attract and support business in Rhode Island through commerce. And uh, you know um, that, that's that's important, especially not only we want our businesses here to grow and continue to grow and make investments. But we always want to attract other business to come in from outside and invest in, uh, in Rhode Island as well. And without a modern commerce department with the programs that they've got in place, that, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely spot on with that. And that's an issue that Rhode Island has grappled with for a very long time right. in terms of you know, how to really fashion that department and bring in professionals that are true legacy economic development professionals. So it, it's a lot different to take on that role and understand what it means to be an economic developer. It's not, it's not really about, you know, knowing how to run a business. It's, that's kind of a, a misnomer in many ways. Right. So uh, I always, um, when I visit your offices, I'm always very envious of the, uh, the view that you have and it didn't always look like that, right? You know, right. years ago, uh, you are down on South Main Street and you basically, you know, it was just, you know, nothing special looking out the window there, but um, everything has really dramatically changed when you look out your window today. So paint us a little picture of, um, of what you see and how you feel when you look at this. Well, if somebody wants to develop the parcel right across the street, right now I've got a view of the river, but if you want to come obstruct my view and build something large right across the street from me, you have my permission. But um, I remember back before we did the relocation of the highway system, I took out my window and it was a 40, 50 foot uh, concrete wall uh, that was the uh, exit ramp to South Main Street. So we were on the, the dead end and the, uh, the old one, I-195 I used to zigzag right around the office here. Uh, and, you know, the relocation of that bridge uh, to the other side of the hurricane barrier then opened up uh, what we all know as the, as the, uh, the 195 district and the knowledge district, et cetera. So that's why I'm very bullish on Providence. There is still a substantial amount of real estate here in the city that is prime for investment. And again, I, I, I think as we go forward in these next few years or so uh, that uh, Providence is going to continue and the state of Rhode is continue, going to continue to be uh, a place where uh, people are going to be looking for uh, investments, especially in, in the city and the opportunities that we're going to have, especially now that we're fixing all of our infrastructure, mm -hmm. modernizing our train stations. We, we were, we're also having talks about additional investments and in, in support in TF Green, which is an asset to the state uh, and uh, in the ability to get in and out of here pretty simple. Um, you know, the ability to move around in the state of Rhode Island, unlike the, uh, you know, our bigger uh, cities to the north and south of us. I, I do think that uh, that we're going to see, you know, a, a renewed interest and investment in the city of Providence uh, or once we come out of this pandemic. So I'm, I'm really bullish on on the future of the city and the, and the future of the state of Rhode Island. Yeah. So um, the work that Governor Raimondo has done under... Um, through her administration and working with um, Commerce Secretary Stephen Fryer, the mayor, uh, right. the trades, of course, and the and the and the members, the you know the construction companies that have worked so very hard. You know, you look out the window there, and you know you've got a new medical school, you have right. a new hotel that's almost finished, right? You have the new the innovation center, Wexford Innovation Center, right yeah. there. That's, that's, that's during, uh, you know, the development. Um, you know, I've got some housing that's happening over here on, on um, across from um, uh, Wickedon Street. So, you know, a good mix of that. And, it, and again, not only bringing business, but then, you know, bringing people into the city that live in the city as well, but we'll create a vibrant city. And then we'll support the small business in the city because after five o'clock, they don't go home. They live downtown. So mm -hmm. as we get more and more investments in, housing and then affordable housing at that as well in the city of providence and then investments in the city itself uh is 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 is, is what we need to do you know mm -hmm. we've got the beautiful pedestrian bridge that we just finished i see more um, uh, you know people and activity walking around the river and, and the beautiful uh you know parks that we've developed and people enjoying you know on a, on a nice day the ability to take a walk at lunch and come out of the office building and and, and do that that didn't happen 
you know, 10, 15 years ago with the old infrastructure that we had out here. That's why when we make these type of investments, we improve the quality of life in Rhode Island. It makes it an, us an attractive mm -hmm. uh, place for people to want to be, live, work, and, and, and play. And again, the other thing that's more, most important of this is they can see the investments we're making in our infrastructure and in our roads and our bridges. They can see the investments that we're making in our K through 12 school system. And, and, and they can see the investments that we've made in our uh, colleges and universities, both Brown and URI and you know, you name it, Johnson Wales and it's et cetera. When, when we look down at URI today, think about these investments, new pharmacy school, new engineering school, new nursing school, new chem lab. I mean, these facilities are on par with any other college or university in the country, right? Brown University right now is uh, is is uh, making their investment in their performing arts center, probably one of the nicest ones in the country. I mean, this is a pretty damn impressive interactive building, and you know, these type of things obviously keep us competitive, keep us on par with other states, and then in some instances, puts us ahead of them. Yeah, so uh, the nursing education facility, we, we talked about the Brown Medical School, but right across the street in Providence, you know, a stone's right. throw where you are, that nursing education facility putting back into play an old power plant. And I mean, I what, sat there for 30 years. That was sitting there for 30 years. Yep. Old and dark, just sitting there. The yep. And now it's, it's you know, alive. There's, there's people in there. There's, par there's a parking garage next door. When you go down Point Street and take that turn and go by that building, that's like one of the nicest boulevards in the city right now. And you've got the Wexford building in front of you. You've got the Brown Medical Building right there that's lit up at night. Now you've got the hotel there. These are the type of things, again, that that stretch before was just kind of desolate. And now it's not. And now it's alive. And they're, you know, obviously people are, are, are distancing. But prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of activity in, in that area, both, you know, day and night. And, and that and that neighborhood that's associated with it with the bars and the restaurants and you know just creating that that environment that young people want to be around young people want to uh, come here and work here and live here and play here so that's that's the, the stuff that we got to continue to do and again that's why i'm bullish on providence yeah and in rhode island <laughs> you mentioned the pedestrian bridge so i have to i have to tell you um the big thing that pe the pedestrian bridge um, is being used for now, and it's really cool because I've seen it a few times. Weddings, socially right. distanced weddings, right, right there on the on the expanse. I mean, I, I sit outside my window from my perspective. I get to see the you know, my panoramic view of the city at night when it's lit up and across open, the river. Open your shade for a sec, so we can. See. <laughs> I don't know if you'll be able to see. No, you can't. But. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and, and again, at, at night when it, when the city's lit up and the bridge is lit up, and again the the nursing, I mean the the, the med school, the way that Brown is ornated that with their lights at night and and, and the surrounding buildings, it just look you know it's just a it's it's a nice place to be day or night. The the view is fantastic. We've made considerable investments in our sewer program with the CSO combined sewer overflow projects that we've done with Narragansett Bay Commission and. Chairman Mezzalello, who's done a fantastic job. We're getting ready to do phase three up in Pawtucket now. Mm -hmm. This river has never been cleaner. When you go, when you go walk, or you see fish in there, you know, lots of them and, and the clarity of it. And, and, and you know, these type of things uh, are, are what makes a quality of life and what makes, uh, you know, being in a certain area special and, and we're special, you know, but wouldn't have happened without these investments, right? Water place park. Think about what that looked like. You know, no Providence Place Mall. It was a train station. It was a dust bowl down there. That city of the the middle of the city of Providence was 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 not that nice. Mm -hmm. Well, we've talked about a lot of things, all of them very positive uh, throughout the course of this this discussion, and it you know it all you know goes to point to the importance of of you know really engaged organizations like the building trades and the business community and being able to partner successfully with our leaders in government to say, hey, you know, the these three 
these three parties together have a major role to play in changing the landscape of our city, our community, all for the better. So we've, we've talked about all of them. We've talked about the bond issues. We've talked about the building. We've talked about the roads. You know, these are, these are significant issues um, where we've truly changed the face of Rhode Island in the course of the last couple of years. And that's because there was a mandate from the people to, to, to get moving on these things. So right. these are initiatives that we have to, you know, I know that we will continue to keep on the front burner and that um, the new leaders that are taking office in the next, you know, few weeks uh, will certainly be interested in working with us on. So let me, let me just um, end by asking you about the new speaker of the house, uh, Joe Shikarchi. I am really excited. I've had the opportunity to work with, uh, Joe, um, you know, pretty pretty good. Um, all the way back, I'll even say to the governor's transition team when he was one of the co-chairs on the transition team, and got to see you know firsthand his uh, you know his intellect and you know his overall uh, understanding and caring for the state of Rhode Island. So I am absolutely um, you know it, so excited about working with a new speaker. I, I know there's no secret that. Uh, uh, Speaker Mattiello and, and the building trades and, and a lot of the unions, we, you know, there were a lot of issues, most specifically the poor Sox, that uh, was an opportunity lost in our opinion. And, um, you know, we, we had a, a difference of opinion on that and a few other things. So, you know, I wish him well going forward, but no, I don't think it's any secret that we're glad he's gone. And, you know, I'm happy for Joe to take over and, you know, maybe get some fresh uh, views and insight on, on, on making continuing okay. investments in the, uh, uh, in the state of Rhode Island. So I am absolutely uh, excited to work with the new speaker and uh, and ma Majority Leader Blaze Jowski as well. I've known Chris for 10 plus years uh, and uh, I think the two of them are gonna do, uh, are gonna do some good things uh, in, in the house. So we, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to interview the new speaker on Chamber TV last week or the week prior episode mm -hmm. number like 97 or thereabouts. And, you know, he was really excited to um, take the reins and to begin his term as speaker. And, you know, I think he's going to be really good for business as well. He understands the importance of right. making sure that business is predictable and that business continues to be uh, an economic engine for jobs in the recovery. And very sensitive to you know what's happened over the course of the last 10 or 11 months with a lot of businesses sidelined many of them in, in a devastating way as a result of the pandemic so we are you know we are equally um excited about the prospects there and also um the senate president he remains the same we have worked with him as well uh president ruggiero and i know that you obviously uh have similar backgrounds with the senate president too Oh, uh, I mean, I've known Dominic for 30 plus years. He was uh, you know, a, a member of my local. Uh, he's been a colleague of mine. He's been a mentor of mine as I've come up through the ranks. Uh, and, uh, you know, having Dominic and, and Mike McCaffrey back in place in the Senate, uh, I, I couldn't be happier with that as well. You know, Dominic gets it. He grew up, uh, you know, in the construction industry, working his way up. Uh, so he understands what it's like to work with your hands and and to you know, be out there, uh, you know, and the importance of, of, of the construction industry and the overall uh, impact it has on, on the economy. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. And I, and I do think that Joe and Dominic, and I'm hopeful again with that uh, uh, the incoming governor, Dan McKee, uh, will continue with the momentum that we have. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think they will. I think they will. I've seen some, you know, considerations, obviously, in this country that, um, you know, we have to have the discussion. And and I just hope that on some of these discussions, and again, some where, uh, you know, your members and, uh, and and sometimes disagree with labor, they're not a lot of them, but the ones that we do disagree, I just know they have to be practical solutions. It can't be all, you know, too far this way or too far that way. As you know, uh, you know, we kind of sit mostly um, or everything kind of gets done in the middle, like to an extent, but we need some reforms. We need some, you know, some issues with the minimum wage. We need investments. We can't tax the crap out of the rich. I understand that as well. We still need incentives in commerce. So we just got to strike the right balance so that we can shore up the middle class in this country, uh, which then again, I believe, and I was 
an economic major, and I was always of the uh, trickle down doesn't work. I like to spread it around, but spread it around with opportunities. Spread it around with teaching people uh, and, and providing them career opportunities and learning a trade and, and giving them giving them the ability uh, to then uh, you know earn for themselves and get out there and provide for their families. That's what I'm about workforce investment. And uh, and I think if we do that and we continue the lines of communication open, like we've been so fortunate to have. Uh, here in Rhode Island with uh, with you and I working together, all of those things that we just talked about over the last hour or so, we were involved in all of them. And we were on the same page on all of them. And some of them, if we weren't together, quite frankly, would not have happened. So we know how to do it. And when we have difference of opinions, we just got to continue to talk through them and hopefully find a common ground so that it's whatever it is is practical and, and we'll continue to uh, keep momentum in this state going forward. And again, I'm I'm optimistic. I, I know we're in place and we've got the tools to do it. It's still gonna require some hard work and roll up our sleeves, but uh, you know, we're prepared to do it. So we have uh, neared the end of our time together, um, but in the last 60 seconds or so that we have left, Michael, I wanna put you on the spot, so I hope you don't mind. You are a very, wise observer, you've seen a lot here in Rhode Island. What are the top three things you think uh, we should be paying attention to in the next six weeks that we might not see coming? What, what, do, you, what do you think? What do you look at? Give us something, give us something to- uh, Well, obviously again- us. The, Tell us something that might surprise us. I'm not saying what will surprise us, but obviously we wanna keep track of is how the vaccines are being rolled out the, the, the transition when it happens and the handoff uh, from the uh, Ramondo administration to the new McKee administration and uh, some of the changes that might happen uh, when that transition happens. And then, you know, is anything in this crazy day and age, just whatever just pops up on a certain day, evident of what happened last week. But I think the, the, the two main focuses, and we gotta, we gotta make sure that, uh, that we do them correctly is Continuing to get the vaccine out in the, the vaccine dis, uh, administered in this state in a in, you know, larger capacity as quick as we can, and then how this transition is going to happen from the Ramundo administration to the McKee administration, and how we're going to be helpful in in making that transition happen. And hopefully, it's a smooth transition. So that's mm -hmm. what I'll be watching. And as you pointed out at the top of the hour, the uh, the process for naming the next lieutenant governor. So coming out of the legislature or being appointed. So again, that's still up in the air. Does the new governor pick or does the general assembly pass something that allows them to, you know, the mechanism to, to vote on it. So that's number three, you gave me the third one. I had two and then you, like, thank you for well, giving me the I was just reading off what you had said at the beginning. So anyway, uh, Michael, thank you so much for being our guest today on Chamber TV. You are a gentleman. Uh, we appreciate the work that we do together with you. Um, your team has made such an important impact uh, on our member businesses. So we are most grateful uh, for that. And I know we'll continue to have lots of things to talk about and compare notes as we head into 2021 in earnest. So. Thank you again. Stay well, be well, and uh, we'll catch you next time. And thank you for having me. And uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, the relationship that we've got here in the chamber and with your leadership there is one of the things that I'm most proud of and since I've been president for 13 years or so. And I'd like to thank all your members as well in, in having in their businesses and what they do for the community and, and employing people in this state. So, uh, you know, I like to send the best and uh, hopefully speedy economic recoveries to businesses large and small in the state of Rhode Island and, and in your chamber. And I'd just like to say thank you and wish them all the best for the new year as well. Thank you. Thank you.